And to start, we have uh, Marco Bertini, a professor at ESADE and a visiting professor at Harvard Business School. He is also senior advisor to BCG's marketing sales and pricing practice. And moreover, he was recently named to the Thinkers 50 Radar and previously nominated for Business Professor of the Year Award. Marco will tell us uh, that how our algorithms are talking to our customers. So please listen very carefully. Marco, the stage is yours. Alberto, thank you very much. I assume that everybody can see me and, and hear me properly. Thank you very much for the introduction. So um, uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be, to be here with you today, even though we're all geographically spread. Um, as Alberto was saying, I want to talk to you about something that I think you've discussed in your, in your companies, but maybe you haven't really formulated uh, formally uh, to date. And uh, to start with, if you just go turn to the next slide, uh, I want to start by telling you something that you already know. Let's start with the things that you guys already know. And if you read this slide over here, you know this already, right? In friendship, in your personal relationships, friendships and money just do not mix. And we all have stories, horror stories, of, you know, uh, a friendship gone bad because money came into the equation. Now, if you're curious to know why that is, why do friends and money don't mix? Uh, well, science comes to the rescue. And science will tell you, sociologists actually, in fact, will tell you that, um, well, friendships are governed by what are called communal norms. A sociologists will tell you communal norms is the mode in friendships. And communal norms are all about understanding each other, uh, being mutually inclusive, um, having shared goals, building something together. That's what friendship is all about, right? And then the money side, the same sociologist will tell you is not about communal norms. It's about market norms. And market norms are not, for, are not uh, mutually inclusive. They're actually mutually exclusive. It's about my goal versus your goal. It's about me winning, you losing. And it's very, very different. And so this is why you see friendship and money don't necessarily mix. Now go off to the next slide. We have the luxury of in personal life to keeping those two things separate. In business life, we just can't, right? So if you think about a business, a business has customers and a business has to mix if it wants to succeed in a very, very delicate balance, by the way, has to mix both these communal norms and the market norms. The communal norms are all the norms that we use when we um, make friends of our customers, when we bring them in, when we make them loyal, when we create value for them. It's all about that, right? All, and we actually say it. It's all about creating relationships with the customers. It's all about um, understanding their needs, their wants, uh, being mutually inclusive. But of course, a business is a business, and a business has a market norm side, the bottom arrow that you see in this slide, which is, of course, about converting some of that value uh, into value for itself. So at some point, we all have to turn all this goodwill into uh, a, a price, which then generates the revenue for ourselves. Now, why am I uh, telling you all about these things that you know you all know about? Let's go to the next slide. So particularly relevant to this particular forum is that technology is driving, and we're not very familiar with this, I think, technology is driving a huge wedge between these two things. So a business has to have both communal norms and market norms, but it has to manage them um, very, very delicately. We cannot be like friends and just do one or the other, okay? Um, Technology is driving a wedge because on the communal side, we have better and better, better understanding of our customers, you know, segments of one we've been saying for, for several years by now. And we increasingly getting closer to our customers. We increasingly know their behaviors better. We are increasingly more intimate about what they have, what they know. And we are better able to offer them personalized offerings. And that's great. No problem about that. But on the other side, okay, technology is also helping us be much and much sharper about the way we generate revenue because we have all this information about you and because we can dynamically change prices through our algorithms and because we can tailor every single one with their own individual price because we know their individual valuations, um, you know, we are getting much, much sharper there. So you got a situation where you've got this delicate, already delicate balance between communal norms and uh, market norms in a business situation and technology is driving a strong wedge. And if we turn the slide, this is where the customers are right now, right? Any, you know, you have to remember that our customers are sense-making humans, not customers, humans in general are sense-making animals, okay? So we need to make sense of things. 
And of course, if we get in the mixed signals from our company, the communal signals and the market signals, and those are even stronger than they were before because of technology, it leads us to worry, what, ask ourselves, what is going on? And in particular, if we focus on pricing and revenue management and the use of algorithms, if we turn to the next slide, we should never forget as a business, never forget as a business, in my opinion, that yes, we use prices to convert value into a monetary term, and that generates revenue, but prices are even, I would say, the strongest signal from a company to a customer about what the company is about. A strongest signal from the company to the customer about what my products are about, about what my values are, what my vision is, what mission is, what my purpose is. So prices are always, in any situation, not only an economic number, but also I, a form of information, which shapes beliefs, and a form of emotion, which of course shapes, shapes, uh, shapes uh, emotions. And, um, and if you think about it in the, cost, in the context of algorithms, which is where, where, where I'm going with this talk is, um, we uh, enjoy the benefits of using algorithms to automatize and make sharper, more crisper predictions about behavior and monetize those, but at the same time, we could be sending much louder signals. If we turn to the next slide, the poster child of this in the last few years has been Uber, right? Uber has this amazing mechanism called surge pricing, which allows me to match supply and demand like never before. It's, it's the competitive advantage probably of this company. But of course, many of us would say, look at the way they've managed it. They've, they've, they've basically put communal norms and market norms on steroids, and some of their pricing decisions made by the algorithms, as you've read in the press over the years, have, have been doubtful at best, which they've corrected since, and have have made them lose incredible amount of worth at the organizational level. That's one. Another example is on the next slide. Uh, in a smaller scale, if you look at football clubs, right? A club clubs have the same story. They've got incredibly strong communal norm relationships with the customers. These are, as you say here, supporters, not customers. But at the same time, the, the, the introduction of dynamic pricing engines in the ticketing of, 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 of football teams or any other live event sort of a, 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 a situation, uh, can create incredible, incredible damage uh, in the goodwill of these, of these supporters if it's not managed carefully. And if you click one more, you will hear a video. So I don't hear it. But... Because we, um, we've spent nine months talking about this with fans. Um, we think it's a great proposition. We think it, there's something in there for everyone, which was the objective that we set out with. And I think, you know, if you look, if you actually study the facts um, around this proposition, it really does have something for everyone. It's, you know, um, yes, I think the, the headline has been about a £77 ticket at Anfield. Um, but the backdrop to that is free tickets for school kids, um, a £9 full price Premier League, Premier League ticket for our Category C games and those £77 tickets, I think there's 200 for six games. So, you know, and there's a whole raft of, of initiatives from young adults, a um, thousand tickets a game at half price, a um, thousand tickets a game for local people, which were all the things that people said that were important, you know, getting more kids into Anfield, getting more younger people into Anfield, getting more local people into Anfield. And we've addressed all of those issues. So, yes, there's a higher price ticket, but but it's balanced off by stretching and creating somebody, you know, something for everyone. So we missed the first part of that video, but this is the, this is sort of the, the, the huge backlash that was received by a, uh, by a model basically recommending a very tiny actually increase in some tickets, only about a thousand tickets, I believe, at Anfield, uh, where everything else sometimes will actually reduce. But that created a huge um, a, a sort of upstorm. Up and in fact, in one game, I believe even the supporters, the 77th minute of the game, walked out of walked out of the stadium. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, and this happens across all sorts of industries, even in the education industry. This is a more of a recent example: the use of algorithms to decide how much how much discount in tuition uh, a potential student gets when coming to college. So the discounts on these um, the aid that goes to students. It's also been, of course, in the, in the public eye because the way it's been assigned. It's assigned uh, because of a regression tells me this variable, which is merit, is actually a good one. But then if you think about the logic of it and the more communal version of that, uh, you have to sort of stop and question it. So if you go to the next slide, um, look, uh, in, so the, 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 my goal, let's, let's turn to the next slide, please. 
the, the, the goal of, of my talk after sort of showing you that the re there are these two sides. And I think whenever we think about introducing systems, uh, they're great. Not, I don't say that they're bad, but we have to think about the human side of, of that as well, of course. Um, then how do we do this, right? How, instead of being panicked, we've got to think about this. How do we think about complementing the, uh, the great benefits that an algorithm brings us with some changes at the, operate, at the organizational level, some changes more at the mentality level, I would say, and then of course, some changes at the actual, act, at the actual actions. So in the next slide, um, at the organizational level, um, if you think about this, one thing that can help you is look at the way pricing decisions are made. That is, um, if you look at the communal norms in my relationship with customers, the creation of value, that's typically led by a marketing team. And the number that you see here, 90%, is from a recent study done of, of chief marketing officers across the world. And they were asked, you know, does your team, the marketing team, uh, lead in the organization its efforts at branding? And of course, 90% of respondents said, yeah, of course, the marketing people are the ones that lead these efforts. And then the same CMOs were asked, hey, do you also lead the uh, market sort of norms version of this, right? The, the other arrow in that loop. And only 21% of CMOs says, yes, we lead it. So here you've got this disconnect, right? Different parts of the organization are leading different parts of the interaction with customers. The marketing people are leading the communal side of the relation of the interaction and other parts of the organization, maybe operations, maybe finance, uh, are leading uh, the uh, market version. And, in, and the more algorithms are introduced, the more operations and less marketing, unfortunately, has a say in what gets done. So if we understand that this is an ongoing relationship that has a delicate balance that has to be maintained, you clearly want to have a more group based decision making process than I think it currently is in many organizations. If we turn the slide, uh, then there's other things that we also have to keep in mind. Uh, in terms of thinking about this, the logic of this, um, our algorithms, are, in the essence, are there to match supply and demand. Okay, And this is great, but think to yourself, what are our customers learning from this? Now, if I'm a company that has a differentiated offering, and I'm proud of my differentiated offering, I would be at least asking myself or wondering or perhaps, perhaps even worried about the fact that I, with, with all these dynamic price changes, I perhaps getting my customers to think that what is really important in this market is supply and demand, not the actual um, differential value offered by a particular offering like mine. Not, not, and, and so customers stop thinking about, hey, what is good about your offering versus the competition, but more like, hey, I need to match supply and demand. Where is supply and demand at this moment? And you're taking people's attention away from the differentiation, the quality to market dynamics, or if you turn to the next slide, the worst case scenario to price itself, right? If you change prices in a way that customers can actually tell what is going on, they see patterns in the data, they're going to start to become overly price conscious. So not only they've moved their attention away from quality and differentiation, but they've moved it to supply and demand and just where's the population moving at any point in time, Okay, and what's the back room look like in terms of the stock, but also to price. Should I wait uh, in order to make my purchase? Should I game the system? Should I use one of those websites that aggregates information and tells me when to wait? You have to be careful of these dynamics that of course are informational, are human, uh, but the, the, the machines are still a little bit hard, um, uh, find it hard to actually uh, back out. Uh, if you look at the next slide, uh, just, to back, just to support what I'm saying, if you just plot very, very easily on Google Trends, the search of under 50, under 100, under 200, under 300, so like searches for products under a price of 50, 100, 200, you will see how there's a one-to-one -one correlation basically with the, with, with the use of technology in making pricing decisions and the price sensitivity of, of, of the general population. Okay, it's something that we have to be careful of. And then last but not least, if we go to the next slide, um, at the level of the actions themselves, uh, what I always recommend for to organizations is to think about this as a, as a continuum, right? The messages that you send out through your constant price changes the, the messages that your customers are listening to range all the way from what the company is about and its, and its mission and its values all the way to the product. At the level of the company, what you want to do is to the best of your ability, if you can, think about how you can tie your price changes in the algorithm, recommended by the algorithms, to behaviors that are consistent with what your brand is about. Because if you can do that, 
then this delicate balance that you're trying to navigate between communal and market is actually more likely to be, uh, to be there, okay? So for example, uh, some years ago before the pandemic forced all of us uh, at home, uh, Disney introduced, as you may know, a sort of a revenue management system. And there the thinking was, uh, how do we, not only how do we optimize our revenue, revenue management system, but also how do we think about the, the, the operational cost of this, and more importantly, cu the customer's experience. That was at the very core of the decision on how to implement and how to decide about this revenue management system. How does our decisions ultimately affect the customer experience? Because the customer experience is what dictates customer satisfaction, and customer satisfaction dictates uh, repeat purchases and recommendations and so on. And of course, they were they were trying to strike that balance between, of course, maximizing the revenue, but also maximizing the experience. In this case, the experience being, can we shift people's behavior to times when there might be less queue, times and places where there might be less queues, such that the experience of the park is maximized and, and, uh, and the lifetime value also is. Uh, and then uh, the, another example that I'm going to show you in one second is about IKEA. Uh, and IKEA, the IKEA brand is very, very strong. And again, what you'll see in the next video is an incredibly strong connection between the ethos of their brand and the implementation of a dynamic pricing model. Um, please, the next slide. Hi, so good Hi. morning. Would you like to pay by cash, card, or by your time? Cash or time. Or would you like to pay with time as well? At the moment, I can see that you have two hours, 35 minutes. Can I pay for these small items with my time? For this one item, sir, it's a total of 45 minutes. And for these three items, it's a total of 1,800 dirhams, sir. That on time, this on card. And just with time. Would you like to have a blue bag? It's only two minutes of your time. 45 minutes, thank you. <laughs> Have I got anything left over for a hot dog, maybe? Everywhere I should do this. Right, so if we turn to the next slide, the very last thing I, that I wanted to, uh, to talk about is, remember I told you there is a continuum. Uh, there is this continuum, the next slide will come, so there it is. Uh, there is this continuum between inferences about the company and its mission and what it's about and the product itself. And at the bottom end, at the product itself, um, you know, think about also, think about dynamic pricing also as a, a, as a bed for testing, as a bed for experimenting. So not only information that you're sending out to customers, but also as information that you can potentially strategically receive from customers. So imagine that, you, that, imagine that you just spend time and money and effort on a, new, on a differentiating feature or an innovation that you're introducing to the marketplace. How can I get feedback from customers about the valuation, their perceptions of the value of that particular feature? By changing prices. So if you think about then how to use dynamic, dynamic pricing, any price change for that matter, whether it's dynamic, well, it's, everything's dynamic, but whether it's algorithmic or not, but as a, as a test, as an experiment to understand the actual Customers putting their money where their mouth is, understanding the actual sensitivity, the actual monetary value of this can be quite um, liberating and quite rich uh, market data uh, about what you're doing. And quick, by the way, quick market data about the kind of about your innovation. And you connect R&D and development much, much quicker to actual market events and market success through these engines.